know, and it's interesting. That brings me to this idea of balance. And, you know, arguably we have a little different view. I think that you are much more flexible in your nutrition than I ever have been, uh, which is fun and funny. Um, And I would say we both agree that restricting carbohydrates to some extent is incredibly valuable as it relates to overall body weight, wellness, inflammation, insulin. And I would love to talk, if you have time, the uh, glucose or the carbohydrate load per meal, really. And I know that that's how you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that there's a lot of good data looking at carbohydrate versus fat, and they're basically energy sources. And I think the body's reasonably flexible about how it balances those calories. So I think some people can get along with higher carbohydrate diets and other people can get along fine with higher fat. But ultimately, the most important thing is balancing calories. Right. Um, We've done a lot of work with weight loss and people who have metabolic syndrome have some of the pre-diabetes kinds of things. And we find that there's a big threshold of carbohydrate intake around 140 grams. Which I think is so, that's so high. Yeah. (laughs) I mean. I think think people need to recognize there actually is an RDA set for carbohydrates. uh, And that's based on, again, kind of a minimum need for what we might call obligatory glucose tissues, the brain, the red blood cells, the kidney. and that number, the basic number is around 80 grams. And with a two, two standard deviation safety factor, the RDA set at 130 grams. And so that's kind of a target. And again, as I think about it, I think you need to have reasons to go away from that number. If you're going to eat more than that, what's the purpose? It's an energy, uh, it's an energy for muscle. So if you're a high-intensity exercise person, there might be a reason to go above 130. If you've got big-time diabetes or problems with insulin sensitivity, there may be reasons to go below 130. But in my mind, you need to justify going away from that number. You need a purpose. You know, I think that the two standard deviations, it just seems so liberal, I guess. I mean... In clinical practice, there's this component of high palatability that yeah. people don't do a good job at self-regulating. Sure. I mean, I just, I, I just. But the two don't standard deviations is the that's the standard that's applied to all nutrients. So I that's know. Where, that's where the protein one comes. I know, from. I know, and you always tell me I can't pick and choose <laughs> what you know, but I truly wish I could. See, that's the trouble. Like. That's the trouble with being trained by a world-renowned scientist is. They make you have integrity with your thinking that you can't just pick and choose whatever value that you want. Um, I mean, people worry about scientists being biased. And I mean, you can always find that. I guess at some level, we all have our bias. But, you know, I think if you're really a good scientist, you want to function on facts and you want to be fair to the data. And I certainly try to do that. (laughs) I know you do. I know even if I would love to get away from, so that's one of the reasons I haven't been able to release my protocol, my second protocol, because I know in personal, from personal experience that I do much better on a lower carbohydrate diet. And I know that most of my patients do way better in initial, in initial phases on a lower carbohydrate diet below the RDA. Yeah. But I have to be able to, you know, I don't know if I'll be able to justify it from a, a science standpoint and I'm not, I'm not uncomfortable with that. I find that having done our weight loss clinic at the University of Illinois for a, a lot of years. And most by the people, way, I collected samples from that. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. that, was the, that was her first penalty, right? <laughs> Gosh. And if you guys want to know more, you can message me. But I really, I really paid my dues when it comes to research. And I am not a research scientist, but man, did I pay my dues in that and way. Gabrielle has never forgiven me. <laughs> you or any of my work at WashU. Never. Yeah. But, you know, I think you and I would agree that the the keys for developing a good diet are having the right kind of healthy vegetables that give you the, the, the 
nutraceutical kinds of things you want, the fiber you want, and the right level of protein that you want, the healthy kind. So we start with those two things. And I think we're very similar on that. The issue then is where are you going to get your energy? And a lot of people have insulin sensitivities, have appetite regulation issues, and get along much better on really low carb diets. They may be sensitive to triglycerides, they may be sensitive to blood pressure, they may be sensitive to COVID virus, all kinds of inflammatory issues where carbohydrates are problems. Um, on the and other hand, and arguably you can generate all the carbohydrate you need for, uh, through yeah. gluconeogenesis from protein ingestion. So for yeah. every 100 grams of protein that you eat, yeah. you can generate 60 grams of glucose. So why eat it? And, 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 and by the way, he does have white bread in his house and carbohydrates. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Very well organized um, pantry. Yeah, yeah. So absolutely. But for me, I, uh, I'm a competitive tennis player. So I'm a high intensity tennis player. Uh, and I just find that I feel better I probably eat closer to 180 grams of carbs per day, and Gabrielle's probably in the 50 range or lower. And you know, we both get along, feel pretty good. Uh, and but you know, we've made a different choice about how we get to that. You know, I'm wondering if there is, and you know, I I don't have any science for this, and I'm not sure how we can determine it, but. I am telling you, there are in people do better with different macronutrient balances. Some people, yeah. you know, it's interesting. I have some vegan vegetarian friends and they thrive with very high carbohydrates and very low protein. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that it's still so early to know why this happens, but the human body is totally flexible. And in that flexibility, it is personal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's no question that there's different insulin sensitivities to people. Um, you know, some people, I mean, you just look at their triglycerides. Uh, you know, some people will maintain triglycerides in the 40s and eat like me, eating 200 grams of carbs per day, and other people would have 400s, you know. And so uh, there's a sensitivity difference there that we need to account for. Um, right. And I think part of that does is genetic as sure. it relates to, to carbohydrates and, and triglycerides. Do you yeah. get the cholesterol question a lot anymore? Do people say, well, uh, you shouldn't eat red meat because of cholesterol? Do people still ask you that? Um, you know, I still find medical people, physicians who will tell their patients that, which is, you know, they'll, they'll find somebody who has a cholesterol of 210 and they'll say, well, you really should be avoiding X, Y, and Z that contain cholesterol. And I mean, that's been disproven for 20 years that dietary cholesterol has almost no effect, certainly in the long run, no effect that basically cholesterol is genetically set in your liver and diet has almost no effect on it. Isn't that so interesting that that still is a discussion and, yeah. and people on the internet ask me that it's, yeah. It's kind of like whoever has a platform to speak about things that are truthful really should do it. So you don't yeah. get that so much, but you do get it from the medical community. I mean, I always worry about the influence of the pharmaceutical companies on the medical community because we have 40 million people taking statins. And if you sort of openly say, well, cholesterol really doesn't make a difference, that kind of hurts the theory. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I think that they view that separating the dietary cholesterol from the blood cholesterol is just too confusing. Huh. You know, we know that blood cholesterol levels can make a difference to health. We know that LDL levels can make a difference. Right. But the, the disconnect is that diet has no effect on that. Hmm. I mean, there is, and do you want to share a little bit more about that? Because I know that we've spoken about that where there will be kind of that honeymoon phase yeah. where if you want to kind of share a little bit about that sure. and then how there's the rebound. Yeah. Where so, we'll I mean, the there. way to understand cholesterol is that it, it's actually an essential nutrient. Right. The saving grace to that is that we make it. So it's not an essential. Uh, otherwise it would be a vitamin. 
but we need a thousand milligrams of cholesterol per day. And we get about 300 milligrams per day in our diet. We only absorb half of it. So that means we have to make 850 per day. Right. So that's the real key. So if you go up or down in cholesterol, say for example, um, you stop eating eggs and all sorts of things and you drop your cholesterol down to 100 per day, chances are you'll see a blood drop Right. It will last for maybe four or five weeks. So typical response is somebody will go to their doctor and they say, well, you really need to avoid cholesterol. And the guy goes home and he does it and he avoids it. And he comes back in four weeks and they take the blood, and their blood cholesterol is down. They say, oh, you're doing a great job. Right, right. And he comes back in two months. He says, oh, it's all back up. You've lost. Well, the right. liver has just finally adopted. You know, it's adapted and gone back to the genetic level. Right. It's and that that's a great point and and I just I really wanted people to hear that. So it's yeah, there is it's, a genetic I mean it's point. cholesterol is one of those things that kind of adapts slowly in the liver and one of the other things that people don't realize is that probably the primary driving force for cholesterol synthesis is insulin. Yes. And one of the reasons you see a lot of people on low carbohydrate diets uh, having much improvements in their blood lipids is because the insulin goes down. Exactly. And that is really the only way that you, or rather that is the way that your diet can actually affect your blood lipids is yep. actually through yep. insulin. Exactly. That and fibers, soluble fibers, which help trap. Yeah, there's that it, it one. Trap, it help trap cholesterol and get it, you know, in your, in your GI tract. So those are really the two things that make it a, mm. a lasting difference in blood, blood cholesterol. And that's, um, pretty interesting and not really what people are talking about. I mean, I'm sure the people watching this will have been exposed to that, but hopefully these conversations that we'll be having will get to other people, other sure. people who, who haven't been exposed to this information, which is incredibly relevant. So, well, this is going to be the first of many conversations. And it's kind of like a, a dream come true because again, we talk just about every day and yeah. for other people to be able to hear your wisdom and just, I mean, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, long time. people may or may not believe it, but these are the <laughs> conversations we have every day. I don't know if that makes us boring, but. <laughs> <laughs> We're totally boring, but it's okay. It's cool. And we've been doing it for years and uh, it's just, gonna, it's so fun to be able to share this. And really the truth is, is if we weren't recording, we would probably go on for another hour until you told me that you had to get off the phone yeah. because you had to focus on some of your other work. Yeah, I have to go eat some carbohydrates. <laughs> right, isn't that true? I mean, you would say, all right, sweetie, you know, we've been on this talking for about an hour and a half now, and I'm going to send you some more papers and we'll talk tomorrow. Yeah, or, or Aries wakes up and takes you away. That's right. Well, uh, Dr. Lehman, as always, pleasure is mine and can't wait to talk to you again, like tomorrow. <laughs> okay, great fun. Thanks.